Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining today's webinar titled um, E-commerce cybersecurity basics for small businesses. This webinar is offered in partnership between um, Tourism Nova Scotia and Digital Nova Scotia through Digiport, a one-stop shop of interactive services and educational opportunities to help tourism businesses develop digital marketing skills and access professional support to improve their online presence. And now this is a two-part workshop, which one of it is happening today and the other will be on Thursday at 10 a.m. And our presenter today is Joel, a broker of um, a broker media, and and Joel, Joel is the founder of a media, and he has a great wealth of experience in developing e-commerce websites, and has interest in cybersecurity. And um, if you do have any questions, please um, put it in the Q and A box below, and we would um, see, read it out as the webinar proceeds. Over to you, Joel. Thank you, Kirch. All right, I'm going to talk about uh, e-commerce cybersecurity today. Um, I have a short presentation here. Hopefully, we can get through it in one hour. Maybe run a little long. Um, so, what I'd like to first talk about is sort of um, introduce uh, the concept of this workshop and sort of how uh, I want it to flow. Um, in the first session here, we will. Um, We'll cover kind of the fundamentals, the basics of um, really why is uh, cybersecurity such an important topic? Um, why are certain types of businesses, especially small businesses at risk? And really what to look out for and familiarize yourself with the terminology uh, involved. So it really isn't designed to be an in-depth analysis of any one particular type. But again, more of an overview and, and having um, an opportunity to familiarize yourself with the topics and with all the different types. So there's a lot of moving parts when it comes to cybersecurity. So having a good grasp of the fundamentals is really imperative in order to begin to um, be even moderately robust at uh, protecting yourself and your online business. So my background as a marketer and a uh, developer um, in e-commerce um, isn't really necessarily a specialization or I never really thought of myself as specializing. Um, although I had an interest in cybersecurity, um, I'm just not that kind of developer. However, it really became a necessity to, uh, to at least have a, a, a robust set of, of best practices, both for my own organization and also um, as a client advocate for uh, many of the different types of small businesses that we work with at our local media. So we'll talk a little bit about um, some best practices for protecting your website, your online store. We'll uh, briefly discuss PIPEA and the implications um, and, and obligations you have under the law at the federal level, as well as ma managing payment security. So talking about payment processors, um, what to look out for, how to work with them um, and better understand the one that you do. And again, uh, just really um, setting up some best practices today uh, for handling um, your customer's data. And um, hopefully by the end of it, you'll have some, uh, you'll have some new things to look for uh, to start Googling or some software to, uh, to try and download and uh, see if you or your team, uh, your employees can, uh, can help navigate it. And then I think what we'll, we'll, we'll really focus on in the second session is um, putting in place some of these best practices. And not only that, but um, creating, uh, starting with a, a good foundation of a really good cybersecurity plan. So uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's get started. So I think the first question that a lot of people have is um, why pick on the small guy? Why pick on uh, why, why you are likely the ideal candidate for a uh, cyber attack? So, Often, um, those who are attacked uh, are especially small businesses. Um, a lot of people think that your, your data, your customer's data, um, however little you may have in the grand scheme of things, is not really um, very valuable. Um, however, 43% of cyber attacks do target small businesses. And I think that's a fairly dated statistic now at 20, 
uh, in 2020. I think um, since then it's it's been increasing fairly dramatically year over year. Uh, the last I've seen, it's been um, closer to 60 to 65 percent. Um, and I guess at the end of the day, it, it's that any information or records you have is valuable. And the reality is that uh, most bad actors or hackers, whatever you want to call them, uh, do realize that uh, small businesses have a very limited budget when it comes to cybersecurity um, budget, both financially and um, in-house expertise and, uh, and your own time and bandwidth. So often um, it's, it makes you especially vulnerable and you could be um, become target because you are often tied to other organizations or larger providers and um, often small businesses, unfortunately, are a secondary target or a collateral damage on their way to a larger target and uh, approving or a training ground for, for a lot of these, um, uh, I guess, people trying to cut their teeth um, when it comes to, uh, to hacking and, uh, and attacking people through, uh, um, through all the different types of methods we'll, uh, we'll discuss through this, uh, this webinar. So collateral damage um, being a direct first hit Understanding um, why someone is going to attack you is uh, is crucial because again, it's still an afterthought for many small businesses. Um, but the reality is, consumers, uh, especially today, do expect that their information, whether that's their personal identifiable information or their financial information, such as credit card payment information. Um, they really do have come to expect, and it is the norm that people um, really expect that this is going to be kept safe and confidential. And it really is under the law, and we'll get into this, um, every consumer's right to demand security from the companies they do business with. So now we'll really talk about um, the different types of uh, common types of cyber attacks. Again, this one's not going to be a comprehensive or in-depth analysis in any one type. Uh, however, we will familiarize, familiarize ourselves with the terms, uh, terminology, which I think is key as well. So that way, uh, if this is part of your um, personal or professional development, uh, you'll know what to look for and how to better educate yourself and, and how to seek out resources. Because um, even cybersecurity experts um, may not be experts in any particular discipline or uh, type of um, fraud or, or attack out there. So let's get ourselves familiar with the um, most common types. So as a non-exhaustive list, um, we'll talk about phishing, uh, which is probably the most common one you'll see. Um, it's probably one of the most, uh, it predates, of course, uh, cybersecurity, but um, it's social engineering is certainly one of the most um, easy ways. And if if I were in a different set of circumstances and, and um, wanted to put my, uh, my black hat on for a moment, I would certainly um, go into social engineering as, as a way to attack, um, particularly small businesses, because it's uh, unfortunately too easy. Um, you know, every week uh, we have attempts within our organization of people pretending uh, typically to be me um, with my employees, but uh, we, we have a number of attempts and we see that a lot of the time. We'll also talk about card testing or card running, um, a, a form of uh, financial fraud um, with stolen credit card information, which is particularly easy to buy in certain corners of the internet. We'll talk about password or brute force attacks, which are still very common. Um, you'll still see lots of bots and we'll talk about bots as well. Uh, we'll talk about malware, um, DOS or DDoS attacks and IoT or Wi-Fi attacks, which if you're in the tourism industry, if you have guests, if you have uh, some sort of public Wi-Fi or guest Wi-Fi, it's really imperative that we'll talk about this topic as well in, in today's uh, webinar. So first up, uh, phishing or social engineering is again, by far the easiest method to attack you with. Uh, if I were to set my sights on your uh, business today, I certainly would use social engineering um, by finding the weakest link in your security network, um, which is the human factor. So finding people that can be tricked or um, quite convincingly uh, lied to into giving up more information or uh, direct data 
or access um, is unfortunately the quite by far and away the easiest way into uh, into anyone's wallet, um, bank account, or into your customer's information. It's likely the most common attack you'll see as a small business. It's often lumped in uh, with spam in your inbox. Um, it's a type of fraud, and it comes in many forms. Um, really, it comes down to the purpose um, that the attacker wants uh, with your information or with your organization. Um, but you'll likely spot it through unusual requests or notifications from known senders. Um, intimidation from out outside sources ranging from Google to the CRA or the government and offers that sound too good to be true um, or simply unidentified or unknown senders with uh, suddenly important things to, uh, to say to you or um, to, uh, to invoice you or, um, of course, the old uh, tried and true practice of the Nigerian prince scam um, money for you. Um, common ones like these, common tropes. Uh, are still practiced today. And unfortunately, um, if you, you know, are one like me to roll your eyes at the thought of falling for a uh, Nigerian prince scam, uh, as dated as that one is, it still works. Uh, it still works. There's a reason why there are thousands and thousands of attempts every hour uh, with phishing scams is because for every 10,000 attempts, uh, there are multiple successes at that. <laughs> And through all, all sorts of varying demographics as well. It's not just um, the grandparents, or the, you know, um, senior citizens who fall prey. It's, uh, it's people in all sorts of um, roles and capacities, uh, higher level, uh, frontline level employees. Uh, everyone is subject to it. Uh, it depends on, depends on the day. And ultimately, it comes down to the controls that you have in place. And again, when you're talking about spear phishing uh, or whaling, you know, you're looking for particular types of people. Um, they know uh, a lot of your information may be published on LinkedIn. So they know how, um, what your background is, what your resume is publicly posted. They can easily um, replicate another profile or an email account that uh, does present to you as well. And we'll talk, and uh, with farming, um, you know, capturing user, user credentials through a fake login landing page is, uh, is one that we're seeing all over social media now. So tricking you into logging into Facebook twice through sending you a link um, or a, a, a sudden uh, important message through an Instagram business profile. Uh, these are com really common ways that we're seeing um, people getting access to your credentials. And really the liability at the end of the day is um, you can lose control of uh, you can lose control of everything um, in terms of your, your user accounts, your Facebook page, um, your Google accounts. Um, and it's often really hard to get back if you've lost control through uh, a, a phishing scam, um, because of course the attackers have the ability to take over your account. And without the proper precautions and, and um, uh, procedures put in place, uh, it, recovery can sometimes be uh, futile. And again, as I said, on phishing on social media, you'll see it in a, a number of different ways. So just like email, um, phishing and fraud happens on social. Uh, it typically goes down in the DMs, um, usually in the form of spoof websites that require you to log in to your social media, uh, your bank. And once the scammer has your logger credentials, they can get, they can get into your Instagram account. Um, I've seen many local businesses lose access to their own Instagram accounts, their Facebook pages. Um, their TikTok accounts and so forth. And really it's, it's not that they wanna necessarily pretend to um, be you or, or to carry on your work, um, marketing your business. Often they will then try to trick your followers um, and to scamming them directly as well. So it's kind of uh, like a virus. It, it replicates, it spreads and it, it propagates from there. And it, and, it uses the credibility that you've built up and leverages it against your contacts and your followers um, once they're inside the account. And you'll see this through all sorts of different methods through um, influencer deals uh, to bogus brand collaboration requests. Um, often you'll see fake giveaways is a big one as well. Um, and again, it's, it's not necessarily that it's a direct uh, ripoff or a scam. 
I know that um, the Costco Facebook page uh, one is a popular one here in Halifax, but what you're going to see is a lot of um, social proof and they're building up profiles or they're or hijacking profiles with a, a decent following that they can later use to, uh, again, trick their, uh, their followers into providing them um, personal uh, information through fake login landing links um, or uh, additional personal information from uh, fake contest entries. And card running and card testing are an important one to talk about. So card testing is the testing of stolen credit card information um, or banking information against your system to either get a free item, um, you know, per, uh, defraud your business into giving them something, uh, shipping something off to them for free, only to have a charge back. Or um, they want to test that they've stolen information and their possession is still working. These cards are usually still in large batches. Um, they're usually exchanged online for relatively small sums of money, considering the potential outcome. And you'll see that order sizes will vary. So the best practice um, in this industry is to, uh, in, to, in this illicit industry, is to um, either test it with a small transaction to see if the credit card is already disabled, or others, there's another school of thought where they will just um, test with a very large transaction, a one and done sort of transaction um, before the card is eventually disabled by the provider. And sometimes they run the cards manually. Um, but most often they're run using a bot. So the transactions will happen in large batches very quickly. Um, most of the time, these uh, attacks will come from the same IP address, but it's possible more sophisticated attempts may uh, have them bouncing multiple IP addresses um, as well. Typically, you'll see uh, IP addresses um, associated with the transaction coming from uh, France, Russia, Pakistan, India, um, or gonna, uh, uh, international destinations that may not necessarily be in your uh, customer profile. So that's an easy way to spot it. Um, however, reacting to it um, uh, in a timely fashion is, is absolutely critical because it can result in your organization incurring uh, chargebacks, being subject to investigation by law enforcement, or even compromising the relationship between you and your payment processors. Without the Without the proper checks and balances in place, um, payment processors may uh, cancel or terminate their uh, relationship with you and may have to find a new payment processor. And we've seen this happen um, to, uh, to small businesses in the past. Next up is brute force and, uh, or password attacks. Another very common and very old school um, type of attack. It's been around for a long time. Probably the most widespread method still. Um, when it comes to authenticating access uh, to secure information systems. Um, it's really attractive for cyber attackers because it's easy to automate through a, through a type of bot. Um, essentially, you're trying to access uh, a person's password so, they can, so you can gain entry into uh, um, backends of websites, uh, see cus more customer information. Again, uh, information is power even when it's... Um, uh, obtained illicitly or through, uh, through black hat methods like this. Um, they're usually going to use a, a myriad of method to identify an individual password using social engineering. Um, but sadly, uh, it's still very easy to, uh, to do because a lot of systems don't have um, uh, limits on failure attempts uh, set up by default. And we're seeing changes with this with WordPress um, many social media pro accounts will only let you fail so many times before your password is automatically reset and sent to the uh, registered email address on file. But there's still many different types of uh, backend systems that do not limit the number of uh, brute force attempts you may have. And unfortunately, password 123 is still up there um, as a very commonly used password. So it's very easy to, uh, to guess. And when you're running um, thousands or millions of attempts per minute, um, through a, uh, a brute force bot, we're seeing this still be a very, uh, by and large, a very successful um, and very um, low cost way uh, for, for attackers to enter systems and gain access through, uh, through guessing the password, essentially. Um, also known as the dictionary attack, uh, essentially just going through a, a common list of uh, passwords uh, to gain access. So again, the liability here is um, 
compromised account uh, and lost control of important assets or accounts. So uh, really, again, just like with phishing, trying to get into someone's account and essentially uh, reset the password on them, lock them out and have only the bad actor left in is, uh, is, a, is one of the most common things you'll see when it comes to um, between phishing and password attacks um, when, it, when it comes to cyber um, illicit cyber activity. Malware, a uh, very deep topic. Um, you're going to talk about uh, spyware, viruses, worms, a uh, very broad topic, um, which uh, Trojans, uh, ransomware, a lot of very specific disciplines that a lot of cybersecurity experts work within. Um, we'll quickly go over the, uh, the key ones that we're seeing a lot of. Um, so viruses, Again, a very old school, um, but still very prevalent one that uh, infects applications, attaches themselves to their initialization sequence, and just like a, uh, just like a real physical virus, uh, replicates itself, infecting other code on your computer or your server, your system. Um, it attaches, them, attaches itself to uh, executable code and associates a, a, themselves with a file by creating a virus file with the same name, but with a a different extension, um, creates a decoy and carries the virus around to uh, not only your system, but eventually other systems as well, other contexts. Trojans are programs hiding inside a useful program with a malicious purpose. So unlike viruses, the Trojan doesn't replicate itself, um, but it's commonly used to establish a backdoor so attackers can uh, exploit a, the system again later. And worms, uh, unlike viruses, they don't attack the host um, they're self-contained programs that propagate across networks and computers. Worms are often installed through email attachments, sending a copy of themselves to every contact in the infected computer email list. And they're commonly used to overload an email server and achieve a, a DOS or a, a DDoS attack, uh, and thus taking a, a website down or taking a server down for a, a good length of time. Ransomware, uh, you may be familiar with this, especially with uh, uh, the popularization of uh, cryptocurrencies uh, as a payment method for ransomware. It's a type of malware um, that denies access to the victim's data, threatening to publish or delete it unless a ransom is paid. Um, one that is uh, fairly topical and you may have heard in the news lately, of course, was the ransomware attack uh, with the uh, Sobeys organization. Uh, so in that critical financial um, or customer data was, was taken essentially left on but encrypted and frozen um, in, the, uh, in their organization's uh, servers and systems. And still more than 100 um, million US dollars every year are paid in digital ransoms. And unfortunately, it is truly the only way to get uh, the, the files back. Um, they're deeply encrypted and there's um, often no hope of recovery without, uh, without a payment. And uh, for the most part, uh, there is some honor amongst thieves in that um, if you pay, they typically do provide um, uh, access to the files. Um, although, albeit, I will say with uh, the caveat of often they will also leave a backdoor for themselves to do it to you again in the future. So um, take that with a grain of salt, but uh, that is what we've seen um, in terms of the trend. So uh, without the decryption key, um, ransomware is, uh, is uh, typically impossible to get around and um, uh, unfortunately, um, a very common one, uh, even for small businesses to receive. And spyware is um, a type of program installed to collect information about users, their systems or browsing habits, and sends data to a remote user. So it's a great way, uh, great way to um, uh, download other um, malicious programs from the web um, automatically, or, um, of course, learn a lot about you and then be able to conduct uh, further spear phishing attacks using your information, the way you talk, the way you uh, communicate through email, those sorts of things. And malware attacks are often, again, leveraged to carry out um, deeper farming attacks, um, men in the middle attacks, and do damage to not only your system's hardware, but also your customer, uh, customer's data, their hardware. Um, and also your reputation, because uh, people will see that um, your website is compromised or that um, you're sending them viruses um, and you'll become, uh, unfortunately, the weak link in their, in their contact list as well. Denial of service or distributed denial of service attacks. Um, it's a 
the type of attack where a computer or a, a machine is used to flood a server with traffic. So it works by flooding systems, servers, or networks with traffic, traffic and packets to overload the bandwidth. Um, when you're setting up your website, uh, whether you're on anything from Squarespace to Shopify to self-hosting your own WordPress site, uh, you will have a limited number of uh, amount of bandwidth, uh, typically, uh, allotted to your site. Um, the upload and download bandwidth, uh, the number of users that can visit your site at one time, there will be some sort of limit uh, with your server instance. And a DOS attack seeks to overload that and um, ultimately run your server uh, at capacity and, and take it down and, and not serve to legitimate uh, users who wish to, uh, wish to connect to your site. Unfortunately, it's very easy uh, as it's an automated process typically. Um, it's very easy to, to um, undertake a DOS attack and it's easy to coordinate. So it's become one of the most pervasive cybersecurity threats uh, that most organizations have to face. And DOS attacks are simple but effective and can bring about devastating damage to companies or individuals they're aimed at. Um, with one simple attack, um, most companies can be put out of action for days or even weeks. And even with sophisticated methods of uh, prevention, unfortunately, DOS attacks are um, hard to prepare for and hard to, uh, um, hard to react to as well. Uh, common signs of DOS attacks, you're going to see poor connectivity, slow performance of your website, uh, high demand for a single page or endpoint, um, your website or system crashing, unusual traffic coming from a single or a small group of IP addresses, a spike in traffic from users with a common profile, such as a web browser version, a geolocation or system model. And ultimately, they can hurt your infrastructure, uh, cost you money, and even damage the relationship between your, your company and your hosting provider, on top of the opportunity cost of your network or website being taken down and, again, legitimate users not being able to access your website. Your visitor's experience could become adversely affected, and the site response is going to be frustrating for anyone who is actually able to uh, access your online store. If you're, um, if you're selling things, you can lose sales. And if you just serve content, your visitors will likely want to go somewhere else to get what they want. And both in terms of your brand's perception and your reputation, um, you'll likely see that you'll have a, a substantial dip when it comes to, uh, to trying to rank with, uh, with Google as well. And often will cost um, substantial time uh, in, in trying to re either reallocate your, your site to a different server or a different host, or increase your bandwidth temporarily to allow uh, legitimate users to, to um, access your website. And if you're paying uh, on a system through something like Blue, uh, Google uh, Cloud Console, um, you'll see a spike in your, uh, your, your billing for the month as well if you're billed based on traffic. So Internet of Things um, or Wi-Fi attacks. If you're um, if you have a physical location such as a restaurant, a tap room, a lounge or seating area, or if you're in, a com in the accommodation or fixed, uh, uh, you're in the in providing um, room rentals. Um, you're going to you're going to have Wi-Fi available to your to your users. You might have um, Internet of Things or IoT devices uh, such as a Google Home. Um, smart devices that you'll see um, that make life easier, but unfortunately become a liability for you. If you have public Wi-Fi or allow others, um, allow employees even to use your um, uh, Wi-Fi on their personal devices, again, um, they could be, become uh, quite easily, especially if you're buying off brand name or cheaper devices to do single things. Um, or even your POS system could become a liability in your Internet of Things. Um, really, they're significant um, because all it takes is um, one outdated firmware, one, um, one piece of hardware that doesn't have an, a software update downloaded to it, and 
and nowadays, a lot of organizations are, are deploying a lot of different types of tools or pieces of hardware um, to do very cool and uh, useful things. But unfortunately, um, without the proper background or cataloging of um, how old or, or useful these items may be to you in the day to day, uh, a lot of these become quickly become outdated. And because they're becoming more popular, attacking them is becoming um, popular as well. And a lot of a lot of times, things like uh, Amazon Alexas uh, sitting around are, are sort of fall into the set it and forget it mode and um, are given really low priority um, to, uh, to update or embed uh, security in these devices and their operating systems. Um, I know of one uh, story of an, um, in an IoT attack case where a Vegas casino was actually attacked because of an outdated firmware set in the uh, internet connected uh, thermometer, a Wi-Fi uh, based thermometer, uh, smart thermometer inside one of the casino's fish tanks. So again, it's, it's that we have a number of devices and without a proper cataloging of devices that are absolutely necessary to uh, either conduct business or to make your um, experience, uh, customer experience um, more beneficial, um, often things just sort of get left behind and left and go unnoticed until unfortunately something is, uh, um, becomes a vulnerability to you physically. So now we'll talk about um, the sort of the prevention methods. Now that we've identified a lot of the, uh, the terminologies, um, the different types of attacks that we need to be wary of, although there are certainly still more, we we'll talk about what we can begin to do uh, today to um, uh, protect your website, um, your online store, and overall your, your organization as a whole, um, and including your customers. So really the question is, what do I do? There's a lot of working moving parts. Um, there's a lot of uh, different types of um, items in your technology stack, your tech stack that you'll need to be aware of. Um, whether it's your email server, your email provider, your website host, your content management system, the list goes on. Unfortunately, um, in order to do business online, especially um, you know, booking, uh, e-commerce, there are just so many different things that um, kind of fall by the wayside. But I think the general rule is if you make it at all difficult or um, not incredibly easy, as unfortunately a lot, of, uh, a lot of organization systems fall into, an attacker will likely move on. Um, There's so many businesses out there for them to target. Um, they don't need to be physically uh, adjacent or, or near you. Um, so they won't want to waste their time on yours if you don't make it easier for them to do their work. And your business um, is likely not worth the hassle for them unless there's a specific type of reason, um, a specific type of spear phishing or a specific organization that you're connected to that they want to uh, try to gain access to through you. They'll likely move on to someone else. And the easiest way to minimize your risk is to create a system that's thorough, rigid, and of course, enforced without exception. So you, you kind of have to always assume that um, websites or any touch point of technology you have is uh, a liability um, and therefore needs to be inventoried and cataloged and uh, it needs to be treated um, as it's inherently insecure. Uh, it's always a work in progress. So a few general best practices that will cover sort of all of the above. Um, do not store hard text records of any login credentials. Uh, unfortunately, I can't tell you how many times I've gone into a client's office um, and I've seen a Twitter or uh, Instagram password uh, posted noted to someone's monitor or their desk. Um, you know, fortunately for them, um, I either already had access to that information um, in an above board fashion or um, I wasn't there to steal that information. So, um, but having gained access to their office, um, or just simply walked by, I could have easily seen that and, uh, unfortunately get, having a, uh, gotten a lot of access to their information. Um, hard text records, uh, hard document records are something that should rarely be used. Um, if you have them, you should, uh, um, consider an, another method, like a password manager tool. Um, you should also, um, 
if you have to store something, um, keep it in a, in a safe or a very uh, secure and uh, not obvious location. Um, you should also use VPNs wherever possible. If you're, uh, if you're using a device that has access to your business accounts um, or information while you're not on your home network, whether you're going on vacation, um, whether you're, you routinely go to Starbucks or a coffee shop near you and use their Wi-Fi from your phone, from your laptop, um, anytime you're not on a trusted home network, and even when you are, arguably, you should be using a VPN as well, a virtual private network. Um, you should also create and identify as part of your plan um, key stakeholders who will act as your response team. So whether it's a tech savvy um, employee, uh, whether it's a trusted operator or, or website developer partner, um, cybersecurity partner that you've uh, consulted with, um, internal and external stakeholders uh, will act as um, a great resource to you should something happen. Um, one piece of advice that I would also give is to not require regular password changes. So a common misconception is that regular password changes will um, make you less vulnerable. Um, it'll change passwords. And while over time, passwords should be changed if um, the account or the system uh, that you use is, is, has become compromised or a mass password um, breach has occurred and uh, information is leaked. Um, not requiring regular, you know, every 30 or 90 day password changes is actually a way to uh, really empower and encourage employees to come up with stronger, um, more difficult uh, passwords to guess. And um, really it's because password attacks have more to do with bad passwords, um, shared passwords or technology-based compromises um, than, it, than they do have to do with, uh, with password age. And finally, um, the general best practice and what you're all here doing today and uh, hopefully joining me in my next session will be um, is to educate yourself. So um, we only cover the most basic types and I encourage you to do your own Googling, um, do your own research on each type. Um, we'll get into more sophisticated um, testing and, um, and to more, I guess, routine exercises you can do with your, with your employees, with your organization. Um, in the next session. But again, um, educating yourself and educating your employees, making a routine discussion, uh, even if it's only every three months, every quarter, um, or twice a year, it's at least something that's going to help um, familiarize yourself and make sure you're not totally in the dark if you become attacked. And again, everything that's connected, um, unfortunately, is a vulnerability and should be treated as though it is... Um, uh, it is a, a liability to you. Sorry about that, guys. <clears throat> a phishing prevention. So again, um, raising awareness about what to look out for with your organizations, with your employees. It only takes one um, bad link click uh, from any one of your employees to compromise the entire organization, unfortunately. Um, phishing attack methods are being developed and redeveloped all the time, um, but they really they sh share commonalities that can be identified if you know what to look for. There are many sites that will keep you informed um, and we'll share a few resources as well um, when we share the, uh, the plan ahead of the next session. But again, the earlier you find out about the latest attack methods and share them with your users through regular uh, security awareness training, the better. So the general best practices here is simply don't click on links or files um, emailed to you, uh, especially from people who you aren't expect uh, are not expecting to hear from. Don't be tempted by pop-ups, um, no matter how good they offer. If you get a strange link or file, report it back to the real sender. So if someone's account, if it is coming from a legitimate sender, but it's something that's unexpected, uh, again, don't click on it, don't open it, um, but report, report it back to them so that they're aware that their account has been compromised or report it as spam so that your email provider um, becomes aware of trends in activity from specific types of accounts. With malware, again, uh, a very difficult and deep topic um, to, uh, to prevent um, 
um, prevent yourself falling, uh, falling victim to falling prey to, but frequent backups, um, constantly updating your software, firewall and antivirus software and scanning. So finding free or low cost, um, subscription tools that keep themselves updated with the latest virus definitions. Um, these uh, companies, whether it's ABG, and we'll, I'll give us a, a few examples of free ones that you can use at the end of this call. They're constantly working on updating the latest virus definitions. Um, virus definitions are essentially uh, files or uh, behaviors that their antivirus software um, scans and looks out for, and the types of um, different types of sophisticated attacks that um, uh, people uh, use, whether it comes to viruses, trojans, or worms, um, they'll actually update themselves constantly. Um, because these, again, just as security uh, updates are constantly coming out, whether you're on a Mac or a, a PC, um, viruses are constantly being updated to um, sort of uh, countervail and uh, circumnavigate a lot of these protections in place. Uh, if you have a website such as uh, uh, on a WordPress site, um, if and when you can use a premium plugin. Um, unfortunately, there's a cost with this, but it is a very much a you get what you pay for um, type of scenario. So having a premium plugin often means that developers are constantly working on upgrading their plugins. Uh, you're supporting developers, but you're also um, ensuring that your your plugin or your uh, app or integration doesn't become out of date and doesn't become a, uh, a loophole or a liability uh, for your website or a, an easy entry point. And install a security specific plugin. So not only um, ensuring that your plugins in general are up to date, but installing something, if you're using WordPress, something like a WordFence um, that will monitor for different types of activity It'll block certain types of activity or certain types of attempts, and uh, also run scans on your on your hosting instance, just like you would on your uh, laptop, your desktop, your local machine. DOS prevention, again, is a difficult one to uh, prevent. Um, it's a difficult one to navigate out of. Um, should you become uh, the subject or the target of one uh, of a denial of service attack? Um, but continuously monitoring your network traffic, setting uptime and downtime um, uh, checkers uh, to, to automatically look at your website's uh, status, um, when it goes down, when it comes up, something to look out for. Um, consider a temporary offlining the website should you become an attack, uh, subject to the attack to mitigate uh, some increased service costs or increased friction with your website for, um, hosting provider. Deploy website security tools um, that remove web-based web -based threats like WordFence, block abnormal traffic or spikes in traffic, um, rate, uh, rate limit velocity IPs, and search for known attack, attack signatures, and use a, um, use a system or a, a platform like Cloudflare uh, as your name server um, to host your DNS settings. Um, these will uh, create these types of methods and, and using firewalls and intrusion detection systems uh, act as traffic scanning barriers between networks. Um, using a, a sophisticated tool like Cloudflare, which is uh, has a great free, uh, free plan, um, is, is a very easy way um, uh, to avoid potentially a catastrophic uh, uh, system failure. And again, um, setup of, of a system like this really only takes um, minutes, uh, certainly no more than an hour to migrate over to. So it's it's really worth the, uh, the time investment, especially because they do have a great uh, free plan. And, um, you know, they do have a lot of uh, their own sophisticated um, uh, measures in place to, to look out for you. And a big one, uh, a very topical one as well, again, with uh, internet of things or, or devices and Wi-Fi um, security, very difficult one to, um, to navigate. Um, I know for myself, I will typically, if I'm at a hotel, if I'm at a coffee shop or traveling abroad, I will only ever connect to something uh, if I'm using uh, VPN. Um, and I would recommend uh, if, you know, if you're hosting guests um, for, for any length of time, um, always recommend to guests and, and uh, always be wary 
um, and, and encourage them to be wary that they should also use their preferred BPM at all times um, as an extra precaution. But ultimately you can always um, catalog, keep a catalog of and periodically set a reminder to, keep, uh, to check device firmware, um, keep it up to date, use a strong password for your Wi-Fi network and change it fairly regularly. So much unlike um, an individual account password, um, when it comes to a Wi-Fi password, uh, changing it um, not ultra frequently, but on a regular basis will ensure that devices that have um, previously connected to it uh, need to reconnect to it uh, through a legitimate method, whether that's um, through a business card or a, uh, a sign within your business with the, with the updated Wi-Fi password, you know, changing it every three months or so is probably the best, um, best general practice to deploy here. Uh, using what's called WPA3 encryption for the Wi-Fi network, um, use, you know, ensuring that you have a password on your even on your guest Wi-Fi, um, and again, having guest Wi-Fi and staff or your own business uh, Wi-Fi networks. Um, a lot of a um, lot of hardware nowadays has the uh, native or or uh, default ability to set up a guest network, and it allows you to limit. Um, your guests access or ability to access uh, particularly sensitive information. Uh, ensure that you um, educate guests on the importance of keeping their personal information secure while using hotel Wi-Fi, uh, creating your own terms of service page um, that guests can access uh, either while they're, while they're browsing your website, while they're staying with you, um, and ensuring that you uh, um, Again, educate them, um, remind them to use a, a VPN at all times, um, can reduce your, your risk of, of liability, but also, again, can encourage just best practices amongst you, uh, your employees, and your guests, and your visitors as well. And uh, ultimately, uh, in creating an inventory and a catalog, um, use only the, the least amount of devices you absolutely need um, to conduct business or uh, to uh, to automate certain processes. Um, on your website as well, ensure that you uh, um, use an SSL certificate or a secure sockets layer for, um, SSL protocol. Uh, essentially what it is, is a digital certificate that's used to establish a secure encrypted connection between a web server and a web browser. Essentially a small piece of code that's installed on a website server. You'll see this a lot of the time when you go to most websites, especially if they have some sort of e-commerce functionality or account-based functionality uh, where users are creating and maintaining accounts. You'll see this um, like in the screenshot here from Google Chrome, um, you'll see the HTTPS um, and, and you'll see typically a green or, or a lock button when you're visiting a website. And that's an indicator and it's become sort of ubiquitous with users that uh, the environment they're uh, currently browsing in is safe and secure and that they can transmit their uh, data um, in a safe and secure fashion, whether that's simple login data to an account on your website or their credit card information. Um, it's a huge trust badge. And without one, um, you know, users may not want to, uh, to, to continue browsing your site. So really the SSL um, certificate uh, creates an encrypted connection between the server and the person's uh, personal uh, or direct web browser, and meaning that information um, exchanged between the server and the browser, such as credit card numbers, um, is protected and can't be read by anyone who uh, intercepts the data. Uh, it's important because it helps prevent hackers from stealing sensitive information. And when a website has an SSL certificate, um, again, showing the lock icon, it, it, it inspires trust in uh, your users. Um, in fact, most of the time, if you are visiting a, a site with an invalid uh, SSL certificate or one that's missing, um, a lot of browsers will actually try to block activity uh, going to your website or will try to um, uh, provide a warning to their users. Um, very jarring and, and uh, unsettling uh, UX or user experience and, um, and often will result in a very, very um, extremely limited uh, conversion rate as well if you're, if you're offering some sort of um, e-commerce uh, uh, environment or experience for your users. So it's an important security measure for any website in general. 
and it helps protect sensitive information. Um, and it also, again, um, is a very easy or low, low to no cost method of um, to, to, to avoid headaches and to also um, increase your, uh, your overall brand's um, reputation as well when it comes to um, new and existing uh, users. So now we'll talk quickly about um, managing payment security. So a big topic um, that has a lot of uh, a lot of nuance to it. Um, however, whether you use Stripe, Square, Shopify, or any other payment processor, you should know the basics of how um, they represent uh, and work with um, uh, your business and, uh, and and help your customers' overall online shopping or booking experience. So payment processors like Stripe and Square act as intermediaries, essentially, that handle the payment process. So businesses don't have to worry about the technical and security aspects of accepting credit and debit card payments and can really focus on their business. Often these come, especially online, uh, at, a, at, a, at a rate for different types of transactions. You'll hear the terms card present or card not present transactions. Um, typically, uh, the rate um, that these organizations charge uh, your business are based on the level of risk, um, the level of risk of fraud um, that they incur when they accept the, the payments um, on your behalf. And one of the biggest advantages of using them, however, is that it uh, removes the need for you to directly handle uh, card information directly. So you don't have to store and maintain um, uh, your own credit card information. Uh, for your users or your customers. It also makes um, uh, it easier to accept payments from businesses all over the world as the payment process will handle conversion of currencies as well. So it's important that you understand um, why a lot of these payment processors um, ask for the information they do during a checkout process. Um, and it's important to work with them um, as often um, it having something like a missing SSL certificate or not having recapture in place um, could actually violate the terms uh, of service or, or terms and conditions of the uh, agreement that you, when you create an, a Stripe account or a Google Pay account or a PayPal account um, and could cause your account to, to be suspended or, or, to, or for one of these um, payment processors to no longer work, work with you. So, um, for best practices here, uh, and I would recommend these often by default, these are turned on, um, but if, they, if they're not, certainly look into the settings um, and to the advanced settings that you can implement um, both on your website and within your, uh, again, Stripe or Square or Shopify payments account. Um, implement CVV verification. So of course that's the, that's the three or four digit code that accompanies the credit card code and expiry. Um, and this really ensures that, um, uh, users must be uh, um, passing these logical fact factual tests when attempting to run their credit card or financial information for payment. And that really means that um, it, it's going to reduce the risk that uh, that card running attempts can actually pass through your systems, as well as using postal or zip code match as well. Um, oftentimes, these uh, stolen batches of stolen credit card um, uh, details don't include postal code, especially. Um, sometimes they won't include the CVV. Uh, so it's a very easy way to make sure that these, um, these requests are declined um, and that you don't have to uh, void transactions manually uh, or, or work with support um, to avoid chargebacks, which can be very costly. Uh, you can also rate and velocity limit IPs or IP addresses to restrict the number of checkout attempts um, one person's machine or their locale kind of produce in one time. For most uh, businesses, you're not going to see dozens of attempts from one single um, IP address uh, in, the, uh, in the span of a few minutes. Um, so limit the number of transactions someone can attempt um, within a certain, amount or, uh, a certain amount of time is a very, very easy method to deploy. One that a lot of these payment processes deploy by default, but one that sometimes you can alter um, uh, based on your customer's habits uh, in the advanced settings of your of your payment processor account. Setting up alerts with your e-commerce engine to receive emails for orders, of course. Um, a lot of you probably have them turned on, but monitoring for activity or unexpected activity. Of course, if you're launching a sale or promotion, um, you're expecting to see a flurry of activity. 
but seeing um, random flurries of activity in the middle of the night, um, something that you should set up alerts for with your payment processor account or with your e-commerce platform as well. And again, work with your payment processor in any way to create blacklists, set up monitoring alerts. Um, blacklists often um, are created by uh, ex um, uh, creating blacklists of countries or IPs that are commonly related to card running attacks. Uh, encrypt data um, if when you can. If you must store it, use some sort of encryption tool or a some sort of uh, password manager tool um, and do not store credit card information in, especially in text files, documents, uh, either in a cloud service or locally on your machine. Require strong passwords on user accounts. So require that user accounts um, must uh, confirm their validity or their status uh, through a double opt-in. So not only does someone have to create um, a user account uh, with a unique credentials, such as a email or username, and password, but they also have to confirm that through the email. And they have to use, uh, you can enforce a strong password as well uh, through a lot of systems. And um, again, uh, just as a reminder, don't store, if wherever, if and when possible, do not store payment information. Uh, don't store it locally um, or don't store it, uh, certainly don't store it in a, uh, in a document or, or on the cloud. And limit the number of um, people that can handle or are authorized to handle um, payment information as well. So again, protecting customer data. So we'll talk about um, best practices for storing and handling customer data, as well as uh, we'll get into PIPEDA briefly. So what is PIPEDA? So PIPEDA is the uh, Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. Um, it's a long name uh, for Canadian law that really regulates how organizations collect, use, and disclose personal information. Uh, small businesses in Canada must comply with PIPEDA in order to protect the personal information of their customers. And personal information um, under the uh, PIPEDA Act actually has a uh, very broad use. So it actually encompasses um, age, name, opinions, evaluations, comments, other personally identifiable information, and even intentions are all considered protected. So. Um, again, it's not just the data that you would collect when you're doing a transaction with a customer. It could also be the data um, and, and users are entitled to the protection of the data that could be identified to them um, from things such as a uh, customer satisfaction survey. Uh, all protectable and, and required by law for you to protect. Um, all businesses do have an obligation to uh, protect, even the private sector, uh, all personal information, regardless of how it's stored. Uh, against loss, uh, theft, or unauthorized access to disclosure, copying, use, or modification. And you're also uh, obligated to develop and implement a security policy to protect the information and use appropriate safeguards to provide necessary protection. So now that you have, a again, um, a, a very layperson's understanding of PIPEDA, um, and my interpretation of it is, it's, an, it's important to um, use this as a baseline and, and as a uh, motivating factor um, to begin to comply with, um, with the regulations and to begin to understand that these regulations, while um, relatively new, are being uh, enforced more and more strictly as um, public outcry, um, when you see massive data breaches, um, certainly is, is beginning to, is beginning to um, peak and you're seeing headlines constantly about um, users really want to control over their information, not only how much you have, but also how you handle it as well. So again, there, there are really several easy steps that small business can take to protect its um, customer's data and comply with PIPEDA. So again, requiring strong passwords on all accounts and devices, not only of, of your users, but also of your employees using different passwords for every single login you have um, without exception, using a password manager, something like LastPass um, to manage passwords so you don't have to remember them and you can create more difficult ones, um, rate and velocity um, limiting, uh, blacklisting IPs of certain countries, especially ones that you don't typically do business with, using multi-factor authentication or also known as um, two-factor authentication wherever and whenever possible. Um, often you're seeing this actually becoming um, required and, and the default. 
certainly limit the collection of personal information. Um, keep it on a um, on a basis of um, what do you uh, what is your priority? What do you need to know? Develop a uh, privacy policy. Again, we'll talk about that in, in our second session of what is a successful privacy policy. Um, what needs to be included? Um, how to develop one? And finally, limit. Uh, access to data and records on a need to know basis. So much like you're limiting your collection to what do you need to know, um, limit access as well um, internally to uh, a need to know basis as well. And of course, um, create and develop a uh, data security policy, um, much like a privacy policy, um, one that governs and guides um, all of your um, internal stakeholders and your employees on um, really what are the steps to protect customer data um, and uh, how to actually um, ensure that they're successful in doing so. And uh, regularly train um, your employees as well on, um, on the, the importance of data security and what they would want to expect as well. Um, putting yourselves in your customer's shoes often is a big, uh, is a big help. Um, and and as, as a way to look at it as, uh, as you've seen in, whether it's the Equifax um, uh, data leak or uh, any any number of data leaks that you see in grabbing news headlines. Um, it's happening all the time with small businesses, um, whether or not they're being transparent about it um, uh, or not. But uh, unfortunately, um, your information is likely, uh, has likely been leaked. Um, uh, at least one of your accounts, if you have dozens of accounts um, uh, like I do within your technology stack, um, or within your personal lives. Um, and unfortunately there's a number of different, uh, compromises that are happening. So being, uh, up to date, both as a, um, as a business and also as a user is important. And they all go hand in hand because all of these accounts are likely tied or have some sort of common tie, whether, um, you're an owner operator or you're a senior person within an organization, um, you're likely using the same system. Uh, to do your personal banking and to do your customer uh, communications or your um, your bookings, and when you have that overlap with one machine, that creates that that commonality between um, your your uh, a lack of air gap between your personal and your professional lives, and it really creates uh, more liabilities. And you can also again um, expect that employees are doing that as well. Um, and I think it's a realistic. Outlook, but it's also important to uh, to consider when uh, when handling um, how you train and and, and uh, onboard and and discuss um, a lot of cybersecurity within your business. So let's um, quickly review uh, where you can start today. So again, we talked about a lot of things, um, and again, um, one common problem that all small businesses have is that they are in fact small. Uh, limited resources and an often uh, limited budget, um, both financially and within your bandwidth and your time uh, to protect yourself. Um, there are many working pieces. Some are difficult to understand. Um, and starting now is probably the best uh, best piece of advice. Um, if you have no protections in place, um, you have to start somewhere. If you have some protections in place, um, often it's important. It's time to do a review. Um, here's some examples of different, um, uh, different platforms, different tools out there that either have uh, free um, open source um, plans or, or, or are free to use and adapt um, and adopt into your organization or ones that are more premium as well. And there's nothing wrong with using um, some free uh, tools. Um, there's very many very robust open source um, pieces of software platforms out there that you can use and uh, and use very successfully as well. And again, it's not about being necessarily perfect. Um, it's about being consistent and it's about ultimately, um, and it's about being uh, more difficult than your, um, than your colleagues or your counterparts to, uh, to compromise. So looking at a few um, really good ideas here as to where to get started, I would recommend, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Clam AV or Clam Antivirus. It's a free and open source um, antivirus software that can be used to scan and remove malware and viruses from your server, your systems. OpenVPN is an open source VPN 
um, that you can recommend to your customers, uh, to your visitors or guests, and um, also um, dispatch to your employees as well. KeePass is a free open source password manager. Um, LastPass also has a great free plan as well, and it can be used to securely uh, store and manage your business's passwords. TrueCrypt is a free open source encryption software, and you can use that to encrypt the data that you need to keep on hand, such as customer data, and protect it from unauthorized access. And OpenSSL. Um, a lot of companies will charge uh, a pretty penny for SSL certificates, but um, really what is sophisticated um, cryptography doesn't really need to come at a, a high premium. And you can use a tool like OpenSSL to create an SSL certificate on your hosting instance for your website as well. Um, and it, it doesn't cost any, uh, anything really. So again, there's a number of lists here and uh, a number of items on the list that will, I would recommend um, you visiting and, and looking into. Um, I'll provide them with the materials um, ahead of the next session, which we'll get into. Um, and we'll talk about, again, protecting, deploying tests and routines against phishing attacks. We'll talk about managing employing access to sensitive information, so deploying password managers, these types of tools, um, creating inventory logs um, for your devices and your employees, and, and really quantifying and articulating um, both to yourselves and your, and your um, business what is a need-to-know basis. And finally, and most importantly, creating a plan. Um, creating a plan what to do in the moment, but also ahead of the time, uh, ahead of time is, uh, when, when you're not in the heat of the moment is, uh, is absolutely critical when it comes to planning and being, uh, prepared for a cyber attack, you know, uh, minimizing damage, how to recover the steps and the script to follow, um, when the worst is, uh, is unfolding. And then we'll recap, um, a lot of the key points and, um, and I'll answer gladly any questions that anyone may have um, in particular to their business, because um, what's likely the case is that what one organization is struggling with is probably being shared by um, everyone else as well. So I uh, certainly invite any, any questions uh, and be glad to answer any questions anyone may have. So thank you. Um, thanks uh, for, for joining me today. Um, and I hope to see you on Thursday as well. Um, I hope that you've uh, found some of the information in this presentation to be informative. And, and again, um, uh, I hope that you are uh, on your way to a, to a safer, more secure uh, uh, e-commerce experience. Thank you, Joel, for this great presentation. Um, there's a question here, and I'll just read it out real quick. So it says, um, if a customer leaves a review on your website or a peer review website, could you use it if you did if you don't reveal their full name? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I think um, often, um, Often what we've seen uh, people do is um, to sort of keep some sort of confidentiality, but also use, um, uh, of course, uh, this is uh, um, this is sort of a broad or, or general bit of advice that I'd provide as a marketer. Um, so when it comes to customer reviews, of course, if you have a professional obligation or some sort of uh, regulation in place, um, this may be, uh, that may be a huge caveat for you, but um, anonymizing or partially anonymizing um, feedback uh, is something that um, we often do uh, as marketers. So using uh, using initials um, or uh, first name, last initial, or completely uh, randomizing the, the, you know, keeping a, a, a review intact verbatim, but randomizing or de uh, anonymizing the, uh, the attribution is something, of course, it, it has a hindrance on the uh, authentication of the social proof, but it certainly is a is a valid tactic that I've seen deployed a lot of the times. So I hope that I hope that answers uh, your question. So, okay. So and Daniel here says thank you. Didn't think this would be aimed at my small business, but it was right on. So thank you very much. So thank you all for thank you all for joining today and um, 
So this um, session was recorded and you can find it on, on Tourism Nova Scotia website and on the Digiport um, YouTube channel as well as, as, as also previous um, webinar recordings. And um, if you, oh, there's a question once ago. Okay, so it says, um, I'm a travel agent considering a booking engine, but have been scared off by the danger of, of, of hacking. Hmm. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, booking engine, um, it really comes down to what, um, familiarity do you have, um, within a tech stack of a booking engine. Also, um, again, I think when it comes to a booking engine, um, you know, without knowing any further contacts, what, what website host you're using, whatnot, um, you know, often booking engines can be difficult to maintain. So um, if, it's, if it's something you're considering, um, if it's something that you are uh, looking at deploying, I would say um, two things. Uh, I would say, you know, I guess consider um, your own ability to uh, maintain and, and regularly schedule um, updates to it, um, whether you're making sure that if it's a plugin, that's something that you're updating regularly, um, you're checking, um, what's being booked through it. You're checking activity, um, making sure that's a regular part of your routine, whether that's once a month or once a quarter, whatever it requires and whatever your volume is. Um, but also again, I think it comes down to, you get what you pay for. So if it's something that's, um, a paid service with a really good, you know, 24 seven, uh, phone or chat support or email support. Um, looking for something like that, that has, um, good, uh, support documentation with it as well. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with free, uh, plugins, especially if it's because of a limited budget. Um, there are a lot of great free resources as I've shared. Um, but often what a lot of people, uh, end up paying for, um, and what really is a value to a lot of people is the, the convenience, um, or the peace of mind of having backup of a support team when, uh, uh, when things go wrong or, um, you know, aren't working as intended. Thank you, Joel. So um, for our upcoming webinar, so on Thursday, Joel will be coming back again to shed more lights on this topic and the time remains at 10 a.m. And we do encourage all participants here today to also join in on, on Thursday. Then on February the 9th, uh, we'll have another webinar titled Email Marketing to Boost Your Business. And this is going to be presented by Maria Chuko from Playground Creative Agency. Um, as I said before, this um, workshop has been recorded and it's going to be on the Digi um, Tourism Nova Scotia website and on the Digiport YouTube channel. So please um, look out to, um, to watch it again. And next... Sorry, my computer stopped. And so, and so, for more um, for more resources, um, you can um connect with TNS and visit their corporate website on the or any of the websites um link on screen right now, and. In the absence of any question, we'd like to say thank you all for joining in today and we hope to see you again on Thursday at 10 a.m.